Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Sam. Thank you for joining us this lunchtime. We know that it takes a few minutes in these sessions for everyone to make some tea, log in, settle down, make sure their speakers are working. So while you're all settling in, I'm going to pop a short video on to set the scene for this afternoon. It'll help us set the scene for the story of HS2 and the archaeology that it's uncovering. So I'm going to pop that video on. It's a great opportunity to make sure your speakers are turned up and I'll be back with you in a couple of minutes. The creation of HS2 is the biggest infrastructure project in Europe. The first new intercity railway to be built north of London in over a century. HS2 is being built in two phases. Phase one will link London and the West Midlands and is due to be completed by 2026. In phase two, the line will extend to Crewe by 2027 and followed by new lines towards Manchester and Leeds by 2033. But before we build bridges, tunnels, tracks and stations, an unprecedented amount of archaeological work will take place along the line of the route. HS2's archaeology programme is the largest ever undertaken in the UK. This once-in-a-generation opportunity allows us to reveal over 10,000 years of British history. Come with us as we take a train through time. Our journey starts a long time ago in the Paleolithic period, where early ancestors roamed in groups hunting and gathering food, then settled and learned how to farm and discovered the secrets of making bronze and iron. We will then travel forward in time to see the mark the Romans left on Britain. From their straight roads and new systems of government to sanitation and town planning. Following the departure of the Romans, we head into medieval Britain. We'll see the effect the Black Death had on villages, towns and cities. And gain insight into how critical battles in the Wars of the Roses unfolded. The final leg of our journey takes us to the Industrial Revolution, where the landscape and infrastructure of Britain saw dramatic changes. Factories were built and the economy grew. In the 19th century, the steam rail network revolutionized how we moved goods and people across the country. In the 21st century, HS2 gives us a chance to do so again, creating a fairer, more balanced and prosperous Britain using the skills and expertise of an unprecedented number of archaeologists all artifacts and human remains will be treated with the dignity care and respect they deserve and all discoveries will be shared with communities retelling the stories of our past helping us understand what made us as a country the sheer scale of possible discoveries the geographical span and the vast range of our history to be unearthed makes HS2's archaeology program a unique opportunity to tell the story of Britain whilst leaving a lasting legacy for generations to come. Thanks very much. So good afternoon. My name is Emma Carter and I'm a commercial archaeologist for Wessex Archaeology. Today I'd like to take you through the results of the archaeological excavations in the area. We'll be looking at a few different sites a couple of them will have human cremations, whilst others seemingly uninformative ditches. But I want to show you that when we look at these sites as a whole, we will see how the archival remains contribute to a much wider story. Now that story starts with sporadic prehistoric activity, which evolves and develops over centuries and millennia into rural settlements and landscapes with set places to revere the dead, and at its heart, a community steeped in agriculture. We'll look at evidence from sparse flint scatters and enigmatic burnt mounds, and we'll reveal human skull fragments found in the foundations of Iron Age of roundhouses. We'll also discuss the enclosure systems that encapsulate and protect these settlements. We will build a picture of the past and we'll understand how these people lived, what they wore, what they ate, what they did with their dead and their rubbish, and how even it smelled. So let's establish our study area. So the sites that we'll look at today vary between trial trenching and mitigation for so just a quick word in terminology and methodology. So trial trenching comes first. 
So we've placed the trenches along the route of the scheme to evaluate the archaeological potential. We'll target the areas with known archaeological anomalies, highlighted perhaps by geophysics work or historical background research. We'll also target areas that are thought to be archaeologically blank or negative. And this is to prove a comprehensive and comparable data set. In some instances, the absence of archaeological features can be just as important. Now, if those trenches do reveal significant archaeology, we'll then be asked to go on to a mitigation. And this is where we mitigate the impact of any future works on the, la on the landscape and the archaeological resource through large scale excavation, investigation and recording of these features. And we can also do more intense analysis in our labs at this stage. We can look at things like soil samples, bone, human bone and other artefacts of stuff like uh, carbon-14 and stuff like that. So we will be looking at the following sites. Kenilworth to Bosel Common, Riverline to Stonely, Cubbington Woods and then Crewe Farm, which we actually saw in that video. So let's start with the oldest or earliest features and artefacts across our sites. We will be looking at the Neolithic period. So flint or lithics play a huge part in representing the Neolithic period and limited quantities of work flint were found at Riverline and Kenilworth to Bosel Common. And Emma, you say lithics. Um, what, can you tell us a little bit more? What does lithic actually mean? What, what does that so mean? So the word lithic comes from lithos, which is Greek for stone. And then obviously we get um, new um, from Neo, so then it basically makes the new, sto uh, the new stone or Neolithic age. You notice that you might hear throughout uh, kids' school curriculum things to refer to as the Stone Age. So that's anything that has the suffix lith lithic to it. So the Mesolithic, Paleolithic, Neolithic going onwards. Now at Riverline, we had eight pieces of worked flint and they were bladelets, flakes and blades. They were recovered from gullies, ditches and a pit. Now, the slide that we're on now shows us how these blades and bladelets can be napped off the flint floor. And this flint assemblage is good quality flint that we have at Riverline. It varies in colour from an opaque mottled grey to a semi-translucent grey and dark brown flint. Now, a good flint is something that you might be able to hold up and see that lovely light shining through it. Now, in the same way that we can regionally distinguish different types of pottery based on colour and material, we can do so to an extent with flint. Now, such colouring of the flint helps us to understand where the flint was mined. And we know that these flints come from a type of drift geology that is non-local to the area. Now, at this stage, we haven't pinpointed the original mining location, but it does tell us that flint tools were brought into the site by humans. Now, moving on to Kenilworth, we have 10 pieces of worked flint, and that's uh, a core, seven flakes, two, two of them are broken, and small pieces of debitage or chips. And Emma, can you say a little bit more about debitage? What, do, what does debitage, that mean? Debitage, yes, I can. So it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful archaeology word, isn't it? Um, so the, the term debitage basically is the, the rubbish or kind of the bits that chip off when you're napping a, a piece of flint or other stone tool. So the esteemed Phil Harding, our flint master, is sitting there and he's napped a huge chunk of flint into some various tools and blades. Now, if you look at beneath his feet, you've got all those chips and very, very sharp bits. So that's your debitage. Now, a flint specialist or an expert, they'll be able to look at that kind of spread and tell us a bit more about how it was napped and potentially the, the dating range from it. OK, so the, the small group of flint at Kenilworth can only broadly be dated as Neolithic to Bronze Age, as there are no chronologically distinctive tool types in there. Now, the area containing the flint assemblage at Kenilworth has now also moved on to mitigation. And so we hope now to further define evidence of settlement and assess the potential material culture of the peoples in that area. So how do these flint, flints fit into our current understanding of Neolithic life in the region. Well, Neolithic and Bronze Age monuments are sparse within the area, and the majority of known intra-regional evidence is made up from small numbers of pits backfilled with special deposits, and also scatters of worked flint, which may represent widespread occupation, but of low intensity. 
Okay, so we're going to watch a little video that will hopefully show you some of the benefits of drones and how we use them on site to record archaeological features. So we're here swooping over some evaluation trenches, so hopefully you can immediately appreciate just what a great benefit it is to have that high up aerial view. It's particularly useful when looking at mitigation sites like this. So my colleague is excavating a series of pits. The landscape is that kind of baked red of the Midlands clay. Um, and that drone is actually showing us if those pits are in alignment. And that kind of perspective is something that we might miss when we're on the ground. We can also do it, uh, use the drone for aerial surveys of heritage buildings, listed buildings and monuments. So we can do all sorts of areas. We can fly around uh, these fantastic industrial mining locations such as this up in the north. And we can also go onto the sea. So the drone doesn't limit. We can do land, sea, air. We can fly. If we can fly it, we can go there. Now that was my lovely colleague Stuart and we are at the fantastic site that is Crew Farm. At Crew Farm we found a single urned cremation. My colleague Callum is just recording it. He might be able to catch out that kind of round but circular blob beneath his tape measure. So all the hustle and bustle around him are my colleagues trying to understand what the site narrative is and if those features and pits and blobs are related to the cremation practices or an unrelated feature. So Callum is actually bagging up the grave fill of the cremation and my colleague Rob is trying to quadrant this kind of quite baked on area of um, potential funeral pyre debris. Stuart has got the metal detector out because we want to ensure that when we're excavating a site we don't miss a thing. We're trying to see if there's any grave goods related to it. Now this is perhaps the bit you will be hoping to see. This is our urned cremation, uh, so hopefully you're not squeamish. We're actually bandaging that cremation so that when we lift it out the ground, so we can take it back to the lab, it doesn't bust apart or bust open. Because if you think that grey fill that's been pushing against that pot containing the cremated human remains has been there for centuries, if we remove that, that can make it more unstable. And that's why we wrap it up so carefully with that due diligence and respect. So my colleagues are trying to go on to further investigate what is going on on this site. It was actually at evaluation that we found that cremation. So what we're seeing now is the drone flying up into the air and it's actually going to make a photogrammetric model of what was happening on that site. So these triangles are our polygons and they spatially render with an accuracy of between two and a half to three centimeters what's happening on the ground. So each pixel from our drone uh, is accurate within two and a half to three centimeters depending on the height. So we're swooping all across uh, the crew farm site itself. We're not stopping in any particular place because that drone footage showed that the site was actually quite boring. It was just the um, cremation that was exciting. Drones can also do LiDAR footage and LiDAR recording surveys. So this kind of grayscale is made up from the LiDAR. We're putting lasers into the ground basically to find out what's happening beneath and we can see here that in this field there is what looks like to be a uh, round barrow so it's kind of that donut shape and as we swoop across over there moving further north um, we can go back to the um, evaluation site so hopefully it's given you a little bit of an idea of some of the benefits that drones have for us now pollen analysis across the region has also suggested that forest clearance began during the third millennium BC. So we are seeing a landscape with limited agricultural activity and maintenance of elements of hunter-gatherer activity as well. So Emma, when we talk about this um, interregionality, are we suggesting that people are moving around the country and traveling at this stage? Yes, yeah, absolutely. So within that small handful of white flint, we know that Neolithic people, they were traveling through the region, bringing flint with them from non-local places, and in some instances, actually napping those flint tools whilst they were here. So these sparse flint scatters at Riverley and Mount Kenilworth, they may be indicative of sporadic prehistoric settlement within the area, and in an area in which some forests were being felled and other people were using flint tools to hunt, and perhaps they were actually supplementing their small harvest by doing that hunter-gatherer lifestyle as well. So when we move on to the Bronze Age, 
Um, those flint scatters are only whispers of the Neolithic across these sites, but Bronze Age remains are a little bit more substantial, but no less intriguing. So distinctions between Bronze Age and Iron Age features and artefacts, however, can be a little blurred as the features and wear types are long lived throughout these periods. Now, one feature found, found throughout the region that is generally attributed to the Bronze Age are burnt mounds. I really like them. Um, so burnt mounds are common features in the Midlands and they're usually discovered in proximity to watercourses. They're made up from a deliberate accumulation of burnt heat affected stones, ash and charcoal, and they usually have a, a kidney bean or a circular shape. Now they can range in size from about not half a meter high, 10 meters wide, up to a whopping three meters high and 35 meters in diameter. So imagine all those bits of burnt stone tipped and tumbled, quite a significant amount of um, material there. Now throughout our excavations along the route at HS2 where we've encountered burnt mounds we've also found pits nearby containing that same burnt mound material. Now at Riverline on the downward slope of a gentle hill a burnt mound was identified through the geophysics and then we confirmed it through the excavations as it was partially revealed in Trench 82. Now, we did hope to identify the limit and extent of the burnt mound further, but unfortunately a badger set nearby prevented additional excavation. So at this stage, we're unable to categorize the shape of it. However, the common vein of finding pits um, with burnt mound material nearby was actually reinforced at Riverline. So located some 318, 300 meters west and west southwest of Trench 82, Pits containing burnt mound material was found in trenches 69 and 278. Now, the agreed function of burnt mounds are still under discussion, but they are commonly believed to be a result of cooking and or bathing activities. So these pits could be a part of these actions or perhaps potentially some more ritualistic behavior. Now, as we move on to the Iron Age, um, the overlap between the Bronze Age and the Iron Age features on our sites begin to get more visible and also more complex. We see evidence of pit alignments marking boundaries in the landscape, as well as enclosures and burials, suggesting that people are no longer just passing through. So the growing transition and complexity of these Iron Age features forms our core discussion, and for me, the most interesting period of development across the sites when we include human cremation and mortuary landscapes. So when you say a mortuary landscape, what's that? So like a funeral landscape. So one of the, the brilliant things um, about these landscapes, so in the same way that you and I would see a cemetery and a church and we'd recognise it, back in the Iron Age, it's completely different. So this really vibrant reconstruction that I've pulled from our archives, I love it because it just shows the intensity and in what's happening in that funeralistic landscape. In the background, we've got an important earthwork, essentially a hill fort. We've got all these people together gathering around a huge pyre as they're revering and burning uh, their dead. Um, so that, that landscape is basically a landscape of death and burial. And there are certain topographical signifiers that make, it, make us understand that this will be a prime landscape for that type of thing. Um, so the pottery assemblage at Riverleam and Kenilworth are dominated by late Iron Age and Romano British potteries. And the cremated bone from Kenilworth is assumed on pottery grounds to date back to the late Iron Age and or early Romano British period. Now, as we move on to Covington Woods, um, this mitigation site targeted a concentration of pits, gullies and ditches that are identified from the trenching. Now, the site here is on a relatively flat plateau of land before dropping down south towards the River Lean. So with water nearby and the advantage of a slight hill, the topographical area is quite appealing for settlement. And that's exactly what we found. So across the site, 10 enclosure ditches of various sizes and shapes dominated the central and southern portions of the mitigation area. Further pits and gullies were also revealed. And interestingly, four features contained human bone. Now, the interesting bit is that two of those, fe two of those features with human bone were likely to be placed deposits. Now I'll come back to the significance of this a little bit later. So these penannula or ring ditches are believed to represent eavesdrip gullies, a feature integral for the construction of a roundhouse 
as they carry water away from the internal building, much like our gutters do today. So you can see on that um, survey map there how numerous these round ring ditches or penannular ditches are, uh, with some of them surviving better than others. There is an absence of internal features such as hearths, structural posts and floor surfaces, so this may seem a little strange for such definitive signs of settlement. However, comparatively, it's actually characteristic for features like this across the region. Now, unlike some of our sites along the route where the artifactual assemblage is painfully sparse, we actually know quite a bit about what life was like here. So thanks to the artifactual and environmental evidence, we can paint a vibrant picture of daily life in this unique settlement. So the settlement has now been dated back to the late Iron Age and early Romano-British period from around AD 25 to 100. Now in use for just 75 years and bracketing the Roman invasion, this site has potential to reveal what life was like at a great time of cultural and social political change. And Emma, these periods we talk about, Ramona, British, Iron Age, Stone Age, Bronze Age, I assume these transitions didn't happen overnight. People just didn't wake up and it was suddenly the Romano British period. How do we define <laughs> these periods? Yeah, so it's it's nothing to all like horrible history. So you don't wake up speaking Latin. Um, we we see kind of this this blurring emerging over, um, and that's established by different types of material culture. So the Iron Age people had uh, you know established structures and communities. Uh, but they were starting to incorporate more Roman ways of doing things. So this is where we get that overlap. Um, by Roman ways of doing things, it is things like including the styles and fashions to so the material culture of the Romano-British people. So we actually found a shared of pottery on site and it's effectively a, a local knockoff. So it's a, it's a replica style of a particular high-end uh, Roman ware type of pottery. And we also found a Roman toilet implement, which we'll uh, have a look at a little bit later. So these types of artifacts, when we're found in the same, um, same context, tell us that there's kind of an overlap and a synthesis of uh, those Iron Age cultures and invading Roman cultures as well. So if we think back to kind of the environmental evidence, we can start to paint this lovely picture of what life was like. So if you've been able to walk through the settlement, you might have been able to see the spelt growing nearby and with typical country weeds, uh, sorry, countryside weeds like onion couch, so also called knot or pearl grass, you would also smell a sweet hay scent coming from Gallium virum. So that's a very, very bright yellow, frothy blossom flower, commonly known as ladies' bed straw. This would have been growing around the area. So ladies' bed straw is a very ubiquitous plant in history. And it even features a reference in Chaucer's Canterbury Tales. So as you walk through the settlement, you might even have had a chance to eat some hazelnuts, chew on a bit of bitter sorrel, um, and you might be able to see a uh, butcher uh, carving out a large cattle carcass and perhaps throwing some of those remains to the scavenging dogs nearby. Moving back to that settlement now, you might have been welcomed by this kind of approaching arduous whirring noise, kind of grating and quite rough, and that would be from the, um, the rotary quernstone that the women are using in the village to, to mill down um, and make flour. So this image of abundance is made from the environmental and artifactual evidence gathered from the settlement. And that's actually typical of a self-sufficient producer economy. However, what's really interesting about the settlement is the treatment of human cremains, uh, sorry, human cremated remains. Now, in the northeast part of a central ring ditch on the centre of the site, we did find several fragments of unburnt skull vaults, um, and they were found deliberately placed in the foundations of, of the uh, roundhouse. So this is weird, and it is unusual. So often we talk about the land of the living and the land of the dead, as mortuary landscapes are segregated in the Iron Age communities. So there's a level of kind of separation and reverence. You don't want to live where other people have died, so you separate it out. However, we, meet, we also need to consider that the transportable nature of cremated remains means that some of these cremations and these kind of burnt bits of bone are found outside of these segregated zones. So we also should consider that the ancient mortuary rite of cremation was complex and multifaceted mo mode of disposal of the dead. Is also expensive in terms of at least time and effort and materials and how you burn that person and burn that dead. 
So from, from the site at Covington Woods, we have a minimum of two individuals represented through the human remains at the settlement. Now, both of them are unsex adults, and one was subject to cremation, and the other, whose skull or parts thereof, may have been subject to curation following decomposition, which sounds delightfully grim. Now, with the possibility that this um, curated human had inadvertent burning of parts together with animal as well. So by placing the dead in the foundations of your dwelling, this act could show reverence for your ancestors and provide perhaps an anchoring he heritage or legacy to your settlement. It may also imply a level of permanence to your stronghold. So we don't know if the human remains are Roman or Iron Age due to that overlap of the short-lived occupation. So perhaps if it was Roman invaders, they wished to prove their ownership of the landscape by interring their dead, or alternatively, if this was a reaction from a farming settlement invaded by new cultures, new ways, new fashions, they were attempting to assert a connection back to their old ways. So in either case, we can see that the act of including the dead in the roots of your home was definitely a departure from the transient, low occupation, low density lifestyle that was seen during the Neolithic and Bronze Age periods. So set against a rural backdrop, this practice may be linked to a sense of tethering communities to the land and to the plough. So we can actually have a look at the sites of people that kind of lived on this landscape. So Sam, over to you. Yes, yeah, so I'm just going to load up um, a 3D model we've made of someone who we think might well have lived in a settlement like this. So this, and here is. this is actually Sherford Man, isn't it, Sam? But he's he's made up of all the environmental evidence um, that we've gathered from the site. So down to the clothing he's wearing, uh, the boots on his feet, the, the dagger on his belt, his face as well. This is all reconstructed from evidence found on site. But Sam, could you tell us a little bit more about the site he was from? Yes, and Sherford Man, he's a bit of an odd one, really. He was found in Devon and the archaeological record in Devon isn't particularly extensive. What was particularly interesting about him is his remains were found cremated in an urn, but this urn had been placed inside a large stone structure, and the best way to describe it really is like a stone bath. And we know that this stone bath had been existing in the landscape for some time because the stones on it were quite weathered, and at some point Sherford Man had been cremated, placed in a pot, and then that pot was in turn placed inside this stone structure. And then at some point again, later at a later date, this whole structure was covered in a mound of earth. And then over subsequent years, and we're talking thousands and thousands of years, people had continued to place soil on top of this mound. So the mound grew bigger and bigger, which tells us that this site must have been of importance to people who lived there long after this man was dead and buried and probably forgotten about. Now, to add to the mystery, there was a small stream next to his burial, and on the other side of that stream was another burial, uh, this time of a young teenage girl, we think, and she too had been sequentially covered over with more and more earth. We don't know if they were related, we don't know what the um, reasoning for this continued piling of earth on their graves was, so it's a bit of a mystery, but really good evidence found of how they would have looked. That's really fascinating. I hear you've got an, another artefact to show us as well from our 3D model. Yeah, I thought as we've been talking about uh, clothes, we should maybe have a think about how clothes were made in this period. So this model, Emma, you're, you know more about this one than I do. <laughs> yeah, so this, this wonderful, um, so this is actually a comb that's used for looming. Um, it's made out of bone. And I really like this fact. So you can tell that it's made out of bone. So we look at the, the top there, those little holes kind of bit like a, quite a macabre arrow, isn't it? Um, so those on the inside, that's where the marrow would have been. And they would have got their, their scraper and they would have scraped at that marrow and they would have used that as well. But then they've turned this, this bit of worked bone into a comb. We can see some incredible detailing uh, as we go up and down the sort of the main shaft of it. And then if we just go and pause at the top there, you might be able to make out um, the eyes, the hair, 
than the face coming down. So it's very, very detailed. And then towards the bottom, only just a fragment of the of the actual teeth uh, remain intact. And the, the way this would have been used is those teeth were used to push the warp or the weft, the one that goes across, that's the weft, isn't it? They'd have been used to push that up to the top of the loom uh, to create their fabric. Now, Emma also mentioned earlier uh, the sound of quernstones grinding as people were grinding up grain to make some bread. So we thought we'd also show you what a quernstone would look like so you can visualise that. Lovely. So this, this rotary quern, um, unlike the word debitage, it's actually quite helpfully named as it tells you what it does. Um, so you've got two bits of stone, got a hole in the middle for the, for the grain, and then you see that um, stick of wood coming down to the handle. So you just push that round, bring it round, and that's gonna mill those bits of grain into those two layers of stone. Um, and if we just tilt it to the side, we might be able to make out um, how the inside is sort of slightly chamfered uh, as well. Yeah, you can just see it there on this fantastic model. Yeah, so that would ground and grated against each other. And Sam, you've got some, some more facts about how long that would have taken. So uh, as part of my role as community engagement manager at Wessex, we run events across the country and we have lots of children take part in these events. And we thought it would be a great idea to get a replica quern made so children could have a go at grinding grain because sadly there is a bit of a disconnect in today's society between children understanding that grain is used to create flour and then flour is used to create bread. So to help them link this story together we bought a quern stone, we have one made and we tasked many many children with grinding flour or grinding grain to make flour and we found that over the course we ran a two-day event and on those two days we had about 600 children come through our stand and they were grinding grain from about 10 in the morning till four in the afternoon and they produced about a kilo of flour uh, which wow. isn't very much I'd have worked them harder but it seemed inappropriate um, <laughs> nonetheless it, it is it exemplifies just how valuable a, com a commodity bread would have been in the past something we just take for granted nowadays absolutely now, now one of the things that no, plays go ahead, quite sorry go on now, I was about to say onto our onto our next 3D uh, object. So you've heard us talk quite a lot about urns and cremations. Um, so Sam, do you think we could have a look at one of those? Yes, of course. I'm just bringing it up now. It's beautiful. Um, so this this incredible collared urn isn't from the sites that we've uh, discussed today, but I felt it was just so so well rendered and such a brilliant opportunity to see one of these uh, kind of well see them and touch them in, in 3D. So this this collared cremation urn is finely decorated uh, towards the top. Um, sometimes in these urns we might find that they've actually used their fingernails to make patterning on them. Now if you were to get your fingernail and actually press that against uh, one of those marks it, it still fits and that kind of tangibility uh, to touching the past and someone else's thumbprint or fingerprint is very, very evocative. Thank you. And Emma, there's a couple of questions um, about uh, Borsal Common itself, and that probably links into some uh, questions about blank areas. And we mentioned earlier lack of archaeology. Uh, could you expand on that a little bit? Yeah. So if we if we are in an area where we expected there to be just an abundance of archaeology and then oddly there wasn't. So if we've perhaps done some um, geophysics and there was a couple of glimmers that say we should probably investigate that further and then if we strip that down and obviously we do it in careful spits and we stop at the first archaeological horizon, if that archaeology is what I would call ephemeral, so not very tangible, um, it makes us question what's happened there. If we are in a modern farming landscape, we do always need to consider that modern agriculture will plane down archaeology, so we might get lost to the plough. Um, if that happens, we could metal detect a site or field walk it, and if we find any remains in the surface, that tells us that the modern ploughing has drilled it out. You could also tell us that that area just wasn't inhabited. So um, this is slightly out of the place we're looking at, but I'll use Coles Hill as an example. Um, we've got there's an abundance of archaeology there from the prehistoric to the 19th century 
However, in the middle, there's there's just not a lot of it in the middle. We've got, you know, a hundred trenches in the middle of Coles Hill, not really showing anything other than a couple of um, field drains and kind of early modern uh, land drainage as well. And the reason why we think that is for now is that this part was actually a deer park. So it can give us an indication about uh, its former use before it fell out um, of, of that purpose. And Emma, um, two questions, because I'm going to go and set up the next little bit of our yep. session for everyone. While I'm doing that, can you answer a little bit about trench numbering? Um, what, what are trench numbers? Why do we number them? How is that helpful? But also, I think it'd be really good to talk to people a little bit about the unusual times we're working in and how, when we're working in trenches, how are we reacting to COVID-19? Okay, brilliant. So those are really, really good questions. So trench numbering is a um, it's normally done sequentially, so we want to use the, the numbers to help us identify the trenches. And we can start north to south or east to west. So we'll be um, given the information by, by the client or the developer, or perhaps this will be led by the county archaeologist of where the trenches are. We'll receive that survey data and we'll plot that survey data accurately um, and we'll use our GPSs to stake it out. So for um, for Kenilworth, we had something like 474 trenches. Um, it was quite a number. Um, that would have been slightly more based on the project plan, but sometimes things like um, proximity to uh, badger sets or other ecological constraints, or you might find that the area um, where you were going to put your trenches is uh, a modern farmer's dump. When that happens, we can decide that, okay, we, we won't waste that trenching opportunity in that area that is heavily disturbed or we don't want to disturb those uh, the animals or the protected species then we can reuse those trenches elsewhere down the scheme so you may have seen in some of those um, images that I don't know, went for, the range went from 35 to 60 and then you've got a couple of numbers in at the 200 and that would be that sort of scenario coming into play uh, with those trenches now going on to coronavirus or COVID-19, it has affected the way we do things. So you might have guessed that I'm in my house today um, doing this webinar from my home and it's a wonder that the cat hasn't come in to disturb me. Um, but on site, it's, it's actually a very different story. So as, as soon as the government released that um, we were in lockdown and our way of life was significantly changed by COVID-19, we established communication with HS2 and there was um, strong discussions that we must follow government guidelines and adherence we must keep people safe so we worked together and we worked with a health and safety plan and we changed all of our risk assessments we actually stopped work on site for a day whilst we did this as we want to keep people safe so when it happened we stopped work we reviewed our risk assessments and then we revised our safe systems of work in place so those are things like we have if you go into site it is one person per vehicle. Uh, we do not share vehicles and we do not share accommodation. So at the moment, we've got um, our people out on site at, at Coles Hill. Some of them are living quite a palatial life with a three bedroom house all to themselves. Now, that's actually really important at keeping them safe and keeping their of area contained. Now, when we come on to site, like I said, one person per vehicle, they'll exit your vehicle and you will wipe down all those high contact points with um, antibacterial wipes. And then when we get to site, there will be staggered briefings should they be required. So we have a briefing if there's any change in legislation, if there's any change to the safe ways that we need to work on site. We also ensure that we maintain that two metre dis distancing at all times. Um, you might have been able to gather from the drone footage that that actually is quite easy because once we're out in the open, we've got an entire field uh, to work in. And if you're in a trench, that trench is 50 metres long. And if you're in a mitigation area, um, you know, that you've got all that space there to sort it out. But also we do make sure that um, when we go back to the cabins for break times and lunch times, um, you take all your rubbish with you. You wipe all the surfaces down before you enter. You wipe them down after you've left and then the next person comes in and does that. Uh, so it's, it's those normal, normal measures that the government have set out that we must ensure that we adhere to. So you join me today in the Environmental Processing Laboratory at Wessex Archaeology in Wiltshire. And behind me, at a social distance, is my colleague Jenny. Hello. 
and Jenny's going to tell us a little bit about what she's doing and the kind of material she's processing. So Jenny, what have you got there and what are you doing? So we've got um, we've got some environmental samples from Coles Hill, HS2, and what we're particularly looking for is we're interested in the environmental material. We do get artefacts as well, but we want um, to be able to reconstruct past environments. So we get these buckets from site, and then what we usually do is we'll put them through the tank and this, is the sort of stuff that we want from these samples and um, they're not usually that fruitful they're not always that fruitful sometimes they are but this is like full of charcoal and probably charred plant remains and um, the charge is the important part because that's how the material survives if it wasn't charred it would survive and um, we can get them in waterlogged conditions and also mineralized conditions with fine plant remains but largely it's the um, it's the charred material um, this particular sample um, was clay, so the, 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 um, the feature that it was taken from had a clay like um, soil matrix, which is desperately difficult to break up with your hands. So we've had this um, soaking in um, hydrogen peroxide and water for about the past hour. Um, about an hour ago, uh, we came through and this material was like slabs of like brick. It was just impossible to work with your hands. And now after soaking for an hour, it's beautiful. If it hadn't, if we hadn't have soaked it in peroxide because it was clay, um, we could well, well easily have damaged the archaeological material. If you can see the black stuff floating on top. So that's basically what happens on a, on a larger scale in our tank. So the stuff will float to the top. It's on a pump system as well. So it will flood to the top, it will go over and we'll catch it and, um, in a sieve and that's what we end up with, what like the, um, the tray that you saw a minute ago. So I'll turn this around so yeah. everyone can see it. So what we've got here, and this is charcoal, is it? Yeah. I'll hold this in my hand and so everyone can see it. Scale, like if we, when we study it later on, we'll probably find, find charcoal plant remains, but you might not be able to see that with the, uh, with the eye. And I know one of our audience, Stuart, was asking about uh, charred grain remains. So, Stuart, this is exactly how we find evidence for cereal production. Um, we'd be looking amongst all this organic material for grains and seeds. And, and also, so if they're actually um, processing on site, like from the site, you'll find the chaff. And then we talk about separating the wheat from the chaff. You are, you'll often find the, um, the, the chaff, like the, the charred chaff. And that's how you'll know that they'll be processing on site. Marvellous. Yeah. Thank you very much, Jenny. Yeah. That's great. Thank you. So, uh, Emma, I'm going to hand back to you. Hello. And Emma, we've had a couple more questions uh, while I head back to my office. There's been some questions about what happens to the artefacts when we've done the archaeology, when the trains are running, what's going to happen to all those artefacts? OK, so that's a really good question. So it's, um, as you know, HS2 is a huge site and it runs, you know, all the way up and down the country. So you can imagine that there's going to be lots of different museums that those artefacts are going to. So all the reports that we produce, um, we deposit them on um, the ADS website as well, and, and we upload them to Oasis. So there's access there for those reports. But then those artifacts that we get, um, once they've been analysed by specialists, uh, we've written about them and we've also written their accession number on them, they go to the local museum from where they were from. So there is still, a, I think there's, we're still discussing so if some areas are just like the marginality of one district or the other, the museums will be able to say what area those districts are from. And HS2 will obviously guide that as well. Marvellous. So talking about artefacts, Emma, do you want to have a look at some artefacts together? Yes, yeah, so you mentioned the, uh, the, the Roman toilet implement. I'd love to have a closer look at that, please. Let's just uh, activate another webcam and we'll have a look. So over on our table over here, we've got a selection of artefacts. And the one that Emma, I think, particularly wants me to have a look at is this one here. Is this the correct one, Emma? Yes, yes, that is. So this this is quite a, an odd looking implement and it's actually used to remove your earwax. So the Romans are known for quite a few things, but their hygiene was, was pretty good, I think. Um, so it's on kind of like a, a key ring type 
uh, device and it basically has all of your toiletry needs clustered across it. Um, so there's quite a different range. But yes, so we, we did find the earwax or ear spoon device uh, on our sites as well. The ear spoon, I love it. And Emma, I've also got on this table some other things I thought you might like to talk about. Um, I was going to start, we just had a look at some charcoal a minute ago. I was going to look at some burnt flint. Yeah, so, so burnt flint's actually really important for us when we find it on site. Um, we need to know what type of flint it is. So if we had a burnt flint core, that could be something quite interesting for us to discuss. Um, the way you can tell that the flint is burnt is that it gets all these amazing cracks and fissures running across it, and that kind of indicates that it is heat affected. Um, if it was burnt stone, it goes this lovely sort of bruised red rosy hue, but flint's very different and you get that kind of like whitish grey hue to it. And whilst we're talking about flint, I've got two other kinds of flint on the table here. Uh, should we go with this one first, the blade? Yeah, brilliant. So, so this blade is lovely. We were we were finding blades similar to this um, at uh, at uh, uh, Riverline. Um, the blades are important as it the style and shape of it can help give us an indication of what tool type it is and therefore what date. So different periods. Um, so different periods in the, you know, the, the Paleolithic, Mesolithic, Neolithic, they'll have a sort of a slightly different style of the way that it's napped and coming off. And that gives us a, a diagnostic indicator of what data actually has. We can also read flint and tell us where from the flake it was taken off. And we can look at the, um, the bulb of percussion. So this is basically where, um, in fact, I will turn on my webcam for this. If it's just loading. You're all there, that's good. Yeah, brilliant. So uh, if you can see this bit of flint uh, in my hand, we've got this lovely kind of bulbous, I don't know if you can see that, that bulbous hump going across. So that's the bulb of percussion. That's from where it's struck and then peeled off the, the core itself. Um, we also have a platform or a hammer point here. Um, and that tells us where it's been struck and taken off there. So we can read all of these little indicators and we can build up basically what type of core the flint came from, or if you've just got the floor that's just got the core, what blades have come off of it. And Emma, the final one I thought we should mention are these uh, lovely scrapers. Um, yes. Can you say a little bit about how these are used? Um, so scrapers, again, helpfully named because they do scrape and they scrape and they rend flesh from bone. Um, sometimes the flint that we pick up is still sharp, so you do have to be careful. But um, when you hold them, if Sam can demonstrate holding them, it's, it fits nicely in your hand. And you can really appreciate that it will scrape that off or whatever. So if you're making leather or if you were butchering and want to scrape off those final bits of sinews and flesh, they're extremely useful for that as well. Uh, it is worth saying that these, these particular examples are still sharp. Um, which is incredible, really. They've retained their sharpness over such a long period of time. So, Emma, we'll move on to further questions. Okay. And if anyone else has a question they would like to ask, um, absolutely do pop that in the box. So, the first question we've got, um, this is a question from Chris. What percentage of the HS2 route will we dug? Is it dig? Is it restricted to the randomly spaced trial trenches or do some areas get closer attention? And I think that relates to trenching versus mitigation, doesn't it? Yes, absolutely. Um, so we will we have to do if we're doing a trial trench evaluation, we have to dig four percent of the area. Uh, so our trenches are two meters by, uh, by 50. And if we're going from, say, Kenilworth to Bosel Common, as you can see from the numbers of trenches there, it can get up to the, you know, the 500s and 600s. If we find um, important features or deposits on site, we do have a contingency as well to dig more at that stage. So if we've got a trench and we see perhaps a curving gully in there, we're not going to stop there. We'll be led by the, um, the archaeological specialists at HS2 who are in consultation um, with the county archaeologists and we might expand that area so we can get a better idea of what we're looking at. Now, with those areas, if they have to produce significant remains, so in some areas we might target um, to see if the um, spread of Neolithic activ activity is present or if it's really kind of 
because of paucity of evidence. If we find potential Neolithic spreads, then we will, of course, then write that up, goes into our report, that gets signed off, and then we'll be asked to do a mitigation on that area. So it really depends what the trenching yields. Um, we know in some areas that we will get good results, but we still always will trench. So um, again, going back to Coles Hill, we've got that incredible um, medieval moat, which you can still see on the ground. We're still trenching that because we need to know exactly what's happening beneath it, what the um, deposit scales are, and all that type of information. So yeah, tr uh, trenching first, then based on the results of that trenching will depend how um, how much further we, we mitigate that area. And uh, Emma, Anna is asking, will, we mentioned the badgers earlier that we, we had to stop work because there were badgers in the area. Um, will we go back to that area when the badgers have moved on? That's a really good question. And the answer to that is, uh, I don't know. We can uh, get back to you with an email from that. Um, I can tell you that we did put um, a trench to the east of the burnt mound and we didn't find a continuation there. Um, but in terms of where what happens next for the extent and the limits of that burnt mound will be based on um, the results and the review of the reports that we write. So we can always get back to you with an answer on that. We've got two last questions. So if anyone else wants to ask a question, uh, this is your last chance. So Emma and I will go through the remaining questions we've got. So um, Andrew is asking when, again, regarding human remains, Emma, um, mm -hmm. we know how we can tell if they're child or adult, but are we, once they're an adult, can we tell if they're 20 or 50 or 90? Is that doable? Yeah, it is. Um, the, the older we get, the more aches and pains we have, and those aches and pains do actually have an impact on our, on our skeletal structure. So if you have um, arthritis or rickets or gout, you'll see all those uh, effects on the skeletal skeletal remains depending on the um, level of preservation of the bones will affect how much we can gauge that um, we can also tell if the bones are fused that tells us it's an adult so there are some kind of other osteological indicators that help give us those ideas but you, you do you do see signs of um, if someone was uh, had a very very hard and physical life You'll see the grooves in the in the bones almost from the tendons and the sinew and the muscle so you can read our skeleton tells the story of, of who we are and it's told by the effects of living so we will see that basically in the bones if the preservation is good enough uh, thanks for that, emma um a couple more questions chris is asking uh, so Chris is asking about how the, the extent of archaeology that HS2 is revealing. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about how um, commercial and developer-led archaeology works? Yeah, so this, this is, I can say, it's the biggest scheme that I've ever worked on. Um, and with a scheme with this size, we work very closely with the government. So we've got um, special archaeologists from HS2 that come out and consult with us. So whilst we're on site, um, HS2 will come out every single week. We'll let them know the progress by showing them the features of our site tour, as well as um, email reports and updates. Um, and then they'll decide to kind of move on from there, whether to backfill the trench or expand it. But in terms of how that fits with the wider planning, um, so we've got the National Planning Policy Framework, which basically gives us an idea of um, when when we can dig and when we can't as developers. So if you are making a planning application to dig in an area, even perhaps in the centre of Sheffield where I'm from, um, we have to ensure that the developer isn't going to go through or truncate any archaeological remains. Now Sheffield is a steel city and that's really important to our heritage culture. So when a developer might be digging up in, uh, I don't know, an area near Kellam Island, go visit it if you've not, <laughs> um, we need to ensure that we're not going to affect any of the kind of former steel works that might be there. So that planning application will go to the council and the uh, county archaeologist will say, right, OK, these will be the stipulations in place. Now, because HS2 is such a, a, a huge site um, and a huge scheme, we've actually have something called the herds and they basically are um, research directives that guide our excavation and guide uh, what we want to find out to find in order to solve any gaps in knowledge of the region as well. 
Thank you, Emma. Um, we've got another question which um, I, I can answer this one. This is great. Um, so, Andrew, again, thank you for this. Um, so, can we tell the difference between a male or female if just a skull is found? Um, and actually, Andrew, the answer to that is yes. And when I'm asked this and I'm teaching uh, children or students, I get them to put their hands on their foreheads and scrunch up their eyebrows. Because if you put your hands on your forehead and scrunch up your eyebrows, you can, as a male, you can feel distinct lumps where your eyebrows are. And on a female, that is uh, that's a much lesser extent on a female. The other way we can tell is the muscle attachments at the base of the neck. So if you put your hands on the back of your head, which so is where your neck joins your own skull, um, women have fewer muscle attachment points there, so the bone is much thinner, um, whereas ma uh, males often have much thicker muscle attachment at the base of the skull, so the skull is much thicker at that point where it joins the neck. And our last question, um, about recent finds, um, Mark is asking, um, particularly as we go up the old Kenilworth to Berkswell railway line, um, have we found anything from recent history? Now, Mark, in the future, we're going to be doing some sessions on the Curzon Street and the Grand Junction Railway, which was active in the area coming out of Birmingham. So we're, we're, it's, that which is quite exciting for us because we get to do some recent um, 19th and 20th century archaeology. So absolutely do tune in for that when we go live with that one. But Emma, on the stretch of um, line we've been talking about today, any more recent finds? Um, so that actually... I, th I think that area just falls out the, the the boundary of where we were doing our excavations. Um, certainly within uh, the site boundaries towards uh, Kenilworth to Boswell Common, we haven't found or encountered any um, 19th century or industrial remains relating to the railway. Thank you. And the final question for this afternoon, um, what does UAV stand for? and and the difference between a UAV and a drone. So a UAV is an unmanned aerial vehicle um, and a drone has, we tend not to use the term drone because it has military connotations. Um, a drone is completely independent, it is not controlled by people. So it is like a computer or artificial intelligence, it flies itself, it has pre-programmed instructions for it to carry out. Whereas an unmanned aerial vehicle, a UAV, there is always a pilot. We have qualified pilots here at Wessex and they are always in control of the UAV. And the UAV at no point is flying autonomously. It is all under control by a person. So that is how we define the difference in those two words. So that is all we have time for this afternoon. Thank you so much for joining us. We would love your feedback. Um, there's a link on the screen there, but additionally, after the webinar, at some point tomorrow, you'll receive an automatic email which will encourage you to go to that website and sign up and give your feedback on the event. It's really important for us to know that we are engaging with local communities, which is why to register you had to give your postcode, because a marker of success for us is that we are telling local people about local archaeology in your area.